Hi everyone, welcome back to Lifting the Lamp. Today's video is all about making sigils. I'm gonna tell you about how to uh, get the right kind of statement of intent that you can then use to make a sigil, how to use that statement, that sentence, to craft it into a symbol, and then how to consecrate your sigil. And I'm going to be talking about this in the context of making your sigil into a talisman. So without further ado, uh, let's jump straight into it. As I've already mentioned, the very first step and a very important step, the formulation of the right kind of intent. So what do I mean by this? Well, when you're making a sigil, what you do is you write down a desire that you have, and then you, you write that as a sentence and you reduce the characters comprising that sentence down into an abstract symbol. And the idea is that by transforming the intent into something which is more abstract, it speaks to deeper parts of your mind, uh, which are the parts of the mind that need to be engaged for the magic to work. So the starting point is to have that sentence written down. And the thing that you need to get right with this stage is uh, phrasing that intent phrasing that desire in a precise enough way to get the thing that you want. If you leave the statement as something that's too broad or vague, then uh, you're not necessarily going to get the thing that you want. And if you make it too specific, then you might be restricting the circumstances in which the magic can work. So to demonstrate what I mean, you might want a, uh, a jelly bean. You might want somebody to give you a red jelly bean. But if your statement of intent is simply, I want a jelly bean, not I want a red jelly bean, then the magic may manifest, but somebody may give you a green jelly bean. So it kind of worked, but not really. That's why it's so important to make your intent specific. But again, if you put too much constraint on that, then it becomes too hard. You're setting the bar too high in terms of what you're trying to manifest. So for example, if I say that I want a million dollars tomorrow, uh, there's very few situations where that's a realistic possibility or probability. Uh, a check for one million dollars isn't going to just fall into my lap tomorrow. Uh, so if I phrase a sigil in those terms, if I start with that kind of a statement of intent, uh, it's not going to work. But if I say simply that I want a million dollars and I don't put a time limit on it, or I say I want a million dollars in the next couple of years, uh, then there's a, a lot more uh, possibilities and opportunities for that intent to manifest. I could make a really good investment that pays off in a big way. Uh, maybe I will put a large amount of money on uh, a cryptocurrency that goes to the moon, although admittedly there's probably just as much chance of me winning big at the casino. Or maybe there's other situations which makes it possible for that million dollar amount to be realized. Uh, so by giving the magic that extra time and removing a condition from it, by making the parameters of the, of the statement of intent broader, you're giving it space to work. And I'm going to use an example of a good statement of intent because I'm going to be demonstrating to you um, the process that is involved in the making of a sigil. And so the statement of intent that I'll be using is the sentence, my YouTube channel will have 100,000 subscribers. I'm not putting a time limit on it. Uh, I've said my YouTube channel, but I only have one YouTube channel. So there's no problems about that part of it. Uh, and I've given a specific number of how many subscribers I would like. Uh, so that's what I'll be working with in this video. And it helps me that you're watching this because uh, the more 
people play the video of the sigil being created and the more they observe the sigil being created and the vesting of belief in that sigil, the more powerful it will become. So you're helping me as well by watching this video. Okay, so we've got our sentence, we've got our statement of intent as it were. The next stage is to take that and reduce it down into a symbol that looks occult, that looks magical. And there's various different stages to that process. I'm going to just um, demonstrate that to you now on the camera. There'll be times where I'm just recording what I'm doing uh, and I'll be improvising because uh, the art of sigil creation is very much an improvised process. There's no, there's no set formula that you have to follow every time. You have to follow your intuition a bit when you're coming up with the final design. So I'll show you what that process looks like now. Okay, so you'll see here that I've got my sentence. The first step in any sigil magic working is to reduce this sentence down. And the first step in that is to, first of all, eliminate all of the vowels in the sentence. So I'm gonna do that now. Okay, the next step once you've eliminated your vowels is to eliminate all of the repeating consonants. So that's what I'm gonna do now. Okay, now, now that I have eliminated the redundant letters, I'm going to make a second list down here of all of the remaining letters. So I've gone over and I've realized there was another B that was left, so I've just got rid of that. And I've put the remainder of the letters down here. Uh, the writing is a bit rough because I'm doing this from an angle and from quite a distance. Uh, so just bear with me with that, uh, but what you have here now is that string of letters. So the next step now is that we need to reduce these down. We need to amalgamate, consolidate these letters into a singular symbol. The first step in doing that is identifying letters which uh, have the same kind of shape to them. Um, and because they have the same shape, they can be easily combined. So for example, we see the lines of the D in the B here, uh, as well as in the R. So what we might do, what we might be able to do is, well, we can most definitely get rid of the D uh, we can get rid of the N and the W because they're both kind of contained within the M, but maybe we can have an M that looks something like this, which is kind of like an amalgamation of the letters. Uh, you can say the same thing again for the V. Again with the L, there's an L here, so we can get rid of that. And you could kind of combine the shape of the Y with the uh, W or M shape here to extend this out a little bit. Uh, and you also have the suggestion of a T by doing that. You could add a H shape in here by doing this. The C kind of appears in the S. We'll put the S shape here for now. We don't quite know where we're gonna put this in terms of the, the overall shape, but we need a creative way of combining the B and the R. So you've got a B that looks like that. Now it doesn't have to be the exact angle of every shape, so you could, you could have an R that sort of goes like this. Uh, 
And so now we've reduced our original letters into a series of composite shapes. Now we need to creatively combine these together in some way. So this process is very improvised. Uh, you need to follow your intuition quite a bit. Just go wherever your, your creative first instinct takes you. Uh, at your first attempt, as with any kind of artistic project that you're engaged in, you may make mistakes. Your first design might not be the one that you go with. Uh, it's all part of the creative process. So I'm going to have a look now and see what I can do with these shapes and combine them and reduce them down even further. So what I think I'll do, I'll, I'll make this a kind of a thing at an angle like this. And then I'll do this for this shape. And then I'm going to do this at the bottom. And now there's sort of curves here as well. So what I can do is I can combine the B here and do this. I'm still not quite happy with that. Uh, let's see. Let's see if there's something else I can do. If I do this again. And then this. That looks a bit more interesting. And then I could even extend this around like this. I'm going to try one more design. If I do this and this again, something like that, then I can put the B shape down here. Or if I do it here, That kind of gives us something to work with. There's one final design I'll try. If I put this in here and I take advantage of the, the common curves yet again, I could have something like this. I could have this shape here and then like that. That goes down there. That goes down there. And then this could become the B like that. This is the one I'll go with. This is the one that I'll go with here. So what I want to do now is stylize that even further. Okay, so we have our design, we have our amalgamated composite symbol. We've combined our letters into a sigil. The next step is aesthetic. We need to take this combination of lines and shapes and turn it into something that looks witchy. So if you've ever had a look through medieval grimoires at the kinds of symbols uh, that are used in those books. That's the general aesthetic that we're trying to recreate uh, by further stylizing our sigil. So you could do this by uh, changing the, the length of different lines, changing the proportions of your shape. So I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to make this the main body of the shape again. And then I'm going, but I'm going to extend this a bit more and then make that like that. That creates some quite interesting proportions. And then this bit is going to be, this B shape is going to be more elongated than a regular B. So it might look a bit like this. 
almost like the eyes of a fly or something, like if it was Beelzebub. And then that extends like that, so kind of going in a similar direction to where my intuition was guiding me here. Uh, and then you've got a bit more of an extra curve here, which can go down and curve around like this. And that is the sigil design that I'm going to go with. The other thing that you can do is you can play around with uh, putting little bits on the end uh, of different parts. So for example, I'm going to put a little arrow here. I'm going to put a little circle here. And I'm going to put a little, little line here. And maybe another little circle here. Okay. So this is the sigil. The next step that I'm going to do in stylizing it is adding color. So depending on what kind of magic you practice, you might be a Wiccan or a Neo-Pagan, in which case you might be familiar with the colors of candle magic. Uh, or you might follow the Golden Dawn style of magic and be familiar with the colours of the planets and the, the correspondences to do with that. Uh, but you might want to select a colour which you feel uh, reflects the intent of the working and make your final sigil in that colour. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the colour blue uh, for Jupiter, which represents generosity, expansion, and prosperity. Uh, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to uh, draw this on a piece of card or acrylic paper, as the case may be, in blue and cut it out. And that will create a talismanic pantacle, which has my sigil on it. So that's the next stage of creating the sigil, is to put it onto the final talisman that you want to charge and then once I've done that I will talk us through the final step of sigil magic which is the charging or consecrating of your sigil. Okay so I've finished constructing my talisman now and the finished product looks like this. You see the sigil there in the middle in the color blue for Jupiter. So this is the thing that I'm going to be charging, consecrating in a magical working. So, how exactly does one go about doing that? Well, to charge a talisman, the, the key to understanding the concept of charging is really in the word itself. If you think about charging a battery uh, in a phone or to, to store power in any other sort of a way, you're taking an energetic force and you are putting it into an object so that that object holds the energy and can continue to uh, radiate that energy out in some way, send that energy out in some way, uh, even though it's just an inanimate object. So in much the same way, you are charging the sigil now with your intent so that it stores the energy of the working and continues to radiate that out into the universe and continues to keep manipulating the fabric of reality around it to try and bring your intent into manifestation. That conceptually is the way to kind of understand what's happening here. Um, and of course, there's an internal process associated with that as well in terms of the symbol being seared into your own unconscious mind where it can quite literally work its magic without your conscious, rational mind getting in the way and second-guessing everything. So, how does one exactly achieve this charging or consecrating of a talisman? There's a number of ways of doing it. Um, and there's one very powerful way of doing it, uh, but I can't tell you about that here because uh, this is a YouTube channel. There's certain guidelines that I need to follow. Uh, you can find that information if you really want to look for it. 
So there's many ways to consecrate or charge a sigil or any talisman for that matter, but they all involve um, raising the energy in your body and in your mind, um, creating a high level of energy, of excitement, and then once you have raised that energy, focusing your intention, the whole of your intention on a singular point, in this case, the sigil, um, accompanied with the intent that you want to imbue in that sigil, and then sending all of that energy toward that point and ejecting that energy into that point, uh, sending it all towards the point of concentration. When I'm in a sigil working and I'm building up to the point where I can finally charge the sigil, I'll have the sigil in front of me, maybe on an altar or something, and at first I will simply close my eyes and visualize the outcome that I want to bring to fruition. I will visualize it very clearly as though I'm living it uh, and as though it is as real as the room that I'm in now. And then once I have visualized that to the point where I'm convinced that it is real uh, and that I've created that reality, I will then focus on the sigil. I mean, like, I'll open my eyes and I'll be looking at the sigil and just staring at it. Staring at it for long enough for the, the symbol to really embed itself in my consciousness. And once I've kind of become more familiar with the shape of the sigil, I will then keep looking at the sigil, keep staring at it, which I won't be able to help doing because it's in the center of my vision at this point. And while I'm doing that, I will again visualize that result that I want. And then as I'm projecting my intent, as I'm sending my intent, all of that energy that I've gathered towards that singular focus point in the sigil, I will I will visualize that outcome coming to fruition whilst I'm looking at the sigil. And I'll almost imagine like a Superman's heat vision coming out of my eyes, like the intent, the energy uh, which is imbued with that intent shooting out of my eyes into the sigil where it becomes trapped and stored like the energy in a battery. So sometime after this video is over, I will charge and consecrate my sigil properly. But there's also another step that comes after charging, which is also very important. That is, you need to take your sigil, put it somewhere, and then forget about it. Forget about it, put it out of your mind. Uh, because as I said before, the rational mind, the conscious mind loves to give us you know, negative thoughts. It loves to engage in self-denial, doubt, skepticism. And so you may find yourself, if you dwell too much on the working, uh, inadvertently questioning whether it works, and then you're investing a contradicting belief into the working, which could uh, diminish its effects. So be sure to forget it. And, and once the, the signal has been sent by you charging the talisman into your unconscious, the sigil will do its own work without you even knowing about it. And if you find yourself second guessing the working for whatever reason, and you're afraid that you've, you've leached the energy out of it by doing that, uh, simply charge or consecrate your sigil again. There's really, uh, no limit on how many times you can recharge your sigil, uh, but you only need to do it once for it to work. So that is my video on how to make and charge a sigil. Uh, this is a, a great type of magical working, particularly if you're only just beginning magic. Uh, we have Chaos Magic to thank for this. Uh, it's simple but effective, uh, so give it a go. and. I'd be curious what your results are. Leave your comments down below. 
Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button to support my work, and I'll see you next time.